Hey there everybody, Stuart here. Welcome to the Talent Equation. Um, before we get started with this week's podcast, I wanted to just jump in with a little bit of housekeeping just to let you know that there's uh, some learning and development events coming up where that you might want to be uh, interested in getting involved in. Um, I've got uh, an event happening at Bedford Modern School at the end of November uh, with the uh, fine support of Juan Gonzalez Mendia at Sud America Coaching. It's a, it's another Future of Coaching event. Um, and I have four places up for grabs, 25% off places up for grabs, which I will be um, allocating to uh, supporters of the podcast. So if you're interested in coming along and you want to take advantage of that discount, then uh, highly worthwhile becoming a supporter of the podcast. And um, drop me a line as a supporter uh, on the Patreon, um, on the Patreon messaging and say that you're interested in going and uh, I will will pick four people at random and uh, I'll be able to allocate them um, uh, a space uh, at, uh, at that event and then I'll give you a code and you'll be able to sign in. Um, some members of the conclave are already going to be going and um, again if you wanted to get involved in the conclave there is some space available as well. Um, some people have um, had to drop out because their schedules wouldn't allow them to attend. Uh, they still, they're still staying on board and uh, they uh, get the recordings sent to them even if they can't attend the meetings themselves because we do everything online but if you are interested in getting involved in the conclave then there are a couple of spaces available so um, uh, get on board it's a it's a great thriving community where we're all coaches learners there's there's no hierarchy it doesn't matter what experience you've got we just want to have more people involved and have uh, a good conversation about coaching and help each other on this journey that we're all on uh, as a group of learners. So if you're interested, get involved. Uh, in the meantime, got a great podcast for, the, for you this week, and um, I will leave you to this week's show. Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, having uh, travelled halfway across the globe and currently based in the sprawling metropolis, sunny sprawling metropolis of Birmingham, uh, I'm joined on the podcast this week by Alex Latsku. Alex, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you you are over here, I believe. Before we jump into your backstory, which is my starting point, but you're over here presenting some research to uh, a group, uh, essentially a scientific world scientific congress for cricket um, cricket people. I suppose is that right? I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, yeah, it was a science and medicine congress. Yeah. Oh, good stuff right so you're over there and then meeting some people up whilst there's yeah we, we've just been talking about this off off air uh, scheduled this terribly by recording it whilst the australia england semi-final is going on so we're I'm either <laughs> yeah so depending on how things are going which i'm not watching um uh you know we, who knows we you know we could be uh, uh we could be in good shape or bad shape you just never know um anyway Anyway, starting point. Um, tell us your story then. So um, you've um, you've been making some waves in the world of Twitter, uh, talking about all this these crazy notions like constraints led coaching and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you're doing it in cricket, and and you're obviously uh, you know you're not male, and you're talking <laughs> about cricket. How dare you? So tell us your story. Um, well, if we start all the way at the start, um, I watched one cricket match 
Um, before I decided that I wanted to play, and that's because my little brother did relatively well, and I decided at that point that I was going to bowl faster than he did. Um, and there's so one photo of me as a nine-year-old on the sidelines with a book, and I'm pretty sure that's the last time I voluntarily sat on the sidelines of a cricket match, good old Brackenridge Junior Cricket Club in Brisbane. Um, but, yeah, so from there I played all the way through. I'm actually still playing. Um, I, I did the whole first grade women's debut at 13 or 14. Um, but at that stage we had those Milo into cricket programs running. And so I'd go from training to flocking uh, six and seven year olds in their little games. And I've pretty much been coaching ever since. So I've always managed to balance uh, those two things quite regularly. Um, and it's a nice change in scenery when you go from being trained to training someone. Um, and then the research came as a result of a scholarship at the University of Canberra in women's sports. So what better team to study in the world than the Australian women's cricket team? <laughs> so you're, you're, is that part of your research at the moment then, studying what's going on with the Australian women's team? Well, even just women and talent development in general, I don't think we've ever really stopped to see whether or not we're doing the best that we can, um, given our success is a a great thing, but can we get better? And the rest of the world is going to catch up eventually. So how do we keep finding those little one or two percenters or at least further down the pathway as more people start to flood in? How can we make sure that they have a positive experience so by the time they get to the top, they don't have to go through the same struggles that everybody else did when they were a kid? Mm, okay. Um, you, if I'm right in, in thinking, you, mm. uh, a lot of, well, firstly, how did you then stumble across this crazy world we call constraints-led approach, games-based approach, ecological dynamics, well, all that sort of stuff? What, mm -hmm. what got you into that space? Um, so I remember sitting in a motor control lecture um, and we started the first half of the semester talking about ventral and dorsal systems. We looked at like the anatomy of the eye and the brain and I can map the pathway through the spine if you really want me to and thinking there's no way this is really how the world works. There's no way my brain is literally a hard drive from a computer. There's got to be something more to it. And so when we came back from the mid-semester break, we finished our exam, pretty much forgot everything we'd done before that break. Um, I was first introduced um, with Ian Renshaw as my lecturer uh, about the idea of dynamic systems. And I was sitting in that class thinking, finally, someone's already mapped out all of the things that I thought that we were probably using to, to understand the world around us and so yeah it wasn't mind-blowing it was just more like walking through the front door and being like yes it's uh, the house is already made I just have to go through and pick in all the different cupboards and find anything that I can so that was a really nice feeling <laughs> so so you already had this sort of intuitive sense through the experiences you'd had coaching youngsters mm -hmm. and through your own your own developmental journey yeah. yeah this intuitive sense that um what you were presented with in terms of sort of what you might call traditional cognitive psychology or cognitive neuroscience mm -hmm. wasn't quite going far enough in terms of an explanation around motor control there was a different conceptualization you then you then stumbled across Renshaw's crazy world and then that started to make a bit more sense for you yeah and it just sort of fell into place almost I knew it couldn't be as simple as input output Mm. So many different variables and, and the fact that I was studying exercise science and psychology at the same time as an undergrad, I was very well aware of how influential the world around us can be and social learning and things like that. So I didn't think there was a way that we could develop movement without those things. Um, so when someone had already worked out a way to connect them um, and we were still learning what that connection looks like, um, yeah, I definitely fell into that very quickly. So you're a bit like Ben Galloway then. You're one of Renshaw's rebels, as I'm calling them. Oh, yeah. oh we, we've got a band now, have we? Can you get T-shirts? Uh, you heard it here first. I've just, just coined the phrase. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, this new wave of young researchers that are going out there and creating mayhem in the world of coaching. It's just an excuse to side each other. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, right, so... Just take me back. Something else you said really interesting. I mean, um, I've already written down a couple of great quotes, but um, you said you sat on the sideline, you're watching your little brother play. Um, mm. How old were you at this point? Uh, nine or ten. Nine or ten. He's older or younger? <laughs> Two years younger. <laughs> Two years younger, and he's playing cricket, and you're not, not, you're not, I suppose, allowed, or it's not for you, or perception it wasn't for you, or... 
Yeah, I didn't think I'd enjoy it. I looked at all these little boys running around the field and being told to stand still and thought, nah, I've got too much energy to do this. Why on earth would I just stand in a field for a Saturday morning? I'd rather go do swimming training or whatever I could put my hands on, really. I've played so many sports under the sun. So, yeah, it was um, it was more the fact that if we're going to be there, we might as well do it together. And so I used to play a year down and he'd play a year up because yeah. he was quite a big kid. Um, and so we played in that halfway point together so we could always go to, to training and games at the same time. So what attracted you to bowling particularly? Oh, I just wanted to bowl fast and hit people. As, as crazy as that sounds, like that manipulation of the batter always fascinated me, the fact that I can create an environment where the person down the other end falls for my trap. Mm. As a kid, that was really interesting. Like I can, I can force someone to hit the ball where I want them to go. So we would, would experiment with the craziest fielding positions the second we were allowed to do whatever we wanted. We'd put nobody on the leg side. Mm. Like, okay, I dare you. <laughs> Hit it over there, I dare you. And then we would work out the parameters of, okay, how far away do I have to get from the offside before that becomes a viable option? So we were 12, 13 thinking about affordances without even realising it, but I knew batting was always going to be more complex than, than just contacting the ball so how can we make it more fun and more of a competition and when you've got someone in the backyard who thinks like that as well that competition was always happening it was just it wasn't just I'm gonna hit the ball as far as I can I'm gonna hit it off that fence around that orange tree and get it in that bucket over there like it turned into a pinball machine rather than just cricket so we both learned how to manipulate the ball not just bowl it or or hit it and so that was really fascinating so that's more backyard bowling skill then being developed there. So you, yeah. you, you're you learning to manipulate the ball to create traps for batters. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. And talk me through some of that stuff. What was going, what, what were you working through as you were going, kind of going through this sort of whole backyard exploratorium? It was more, if you hit the window and it breaks, you're grounded for three weeks. Um, yeah. If you hit it back over the, like the garage door for six, that's great go get it before it goes down the drain pipe down the road. Um, <laughs> so you drop the bat and run out the gate and try and chase this tennis ball down. Yeah. Um, but even a little things like we had a really short pitch. Um, so my dad actually built a concrete pitch in the backyard, put carpet on the surface so we could bowl at each other. And there's a video of us on wheelie chairs and a sidearm <laughs> running in <laughs> and whipping this sidearm at each other. Um, and so picking up those cues, like where do you even find cues <laughs> when you're sitting in a wheelie chair and using a sidearm? Um, and then the short distance making you react even quicker. Um, <laughs> it made for some very interesting learning experiences. So um, a, a sidearm for those who oh aren't, aren't initiated by the sport uh, is essentially a dog thrower. Yeah. Uh, one of those plastic dog ball throwers, but obviously adapted for cricket so that you can throw without putting your shoulder out, ball after ball, mm-hmm. after, ball after ball after ball, and generate a lot of pace for a batter. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I was thinking about then was, I was just thinking you just talked about like back backyard games. I've got loads. Uh, but yeah. in our back garden, we used to play with a really, really thin bit of wood. I reckon mm-hmm. it was about two inches wide, maybe a bit wide, maybe a bit, little bit wider, and a golf ball. And our game was called Golf Ball Nightmare. And the reason <laughs> it was a nightmare was because if you um, if you caught one and you really smashed it, we were playing back towards the house, it would go through the patio window. So, of course, yeah. that's never a good thing. Yeah. So, fielding-wise, you were really sharp on the fielding, but you were trying to catch a golf ball, which was coming at you at a, at a high velocity. Mm-hmm. And then crazy. the second bit was, from a bowling perspective, you could get the ball to, you could kind of spin the ball, bowl cutters, get the ball to sort of jag left and right. But it was also yeah. a nightmare because if you decided to come forward to it and it hit you on the shin, it hurt like hell. That's <laughs> bad. Oh, you might as well take a scooter to the shins. It'd yeah. hurt less. <laughs> But it was um, it was a great game because the great thing about it was you had loads of ter- you could play a test match because you got out loads because obviously it's really difficult to score. Um, so um, you know you could have actually like you know you could in, and I, me and my brother in a back uh, back garden you know you're getting people out all the time little nicks get bowling them taking the top of off them the bowl the the wickets as well were uh, an old sled like a toboggan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> random um, yeah. so those are just the crazy things that you do in the back garden when you've got nothing else to do uh, this is one of the reasons I get a bit frustrated with uh, like the challenge we face with 
video games and stuff like that is mm. all this stuff's laid on it's all really exciting and fun i hear my son whooping and hollering upstairs and i'm thinking we didn't have that option so we were outside yeah. doing creating our own real life versions mm-hmm. yeah well, you could definitely hear us whooping or swearing from the backyard like yeah. that that's what happened it yeah. was still engaging enough to get that reaction but yeah i remember just sitting on the the floor of the test uh floor of the living room watching the test match and going why do i have to sit here and watch if we've got cricket balls outside yeah, yeah. And so the second it'd be a break in play. Oh, they're having drinks. Okay, three overs. Let's go. Like a friend of mine's dad used to take us to the test match. So there'd be like you know four of us in the car and 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 mm. we'd be driving. So we'd all go there. We'd get there. We'd sit down for the morning. We'd have eaten our lunches within the first half hour because obviously yep. that's as much as you do. And then after about an hour and a half's play, we're off and we'd have found a place. We're going to go and bought bought a little bat and a ball. We'd have found a place inside the test ground at Old Trafford. Yep. And we just play all afternoon while he watch the cricket. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're happy because they know you're relatively safe running around playing cricket because you'll end up with a horde of people just in the same game yeah. maybe, having your own test out the back. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely every, every now and again some like some bloke could walk up you know he'd had a bit too much to drink and go oh I'll get you out you know mm-hmm. smack him for six brilliant Always. <laughs> <laughs> so you said earlier on about this idea of trapping batsmen is that something mm-hmm. so you said you did lots of other sports yeah did you take a similar approach to all the other sports you were playing were you looking at them in that way and considering strategic approaches to achieving your goal that kind of stuff is this is this something that's common or is it just unique to cricket always always I mean we played touch football in the lunch yard all the time and, and so because there was a very small primary public school um, there was only about 30 of us who were actually probably fit enough to, to consistently play and so when they're doing the team selections and you know how biased like I don't even know, eight or nine-year-olds can be when you're picking a team and then when you get to 12 and 13, it's even worse. And you always had to find something that could get you picked um, and I'd always pick the gaps to set up a play. So I would never be the one scoring the trial, but I guarantee you we can manipulate the team into moving so we can create the overlap on the side and we just send the fastest kid down the sideline. And so then when they worked out that we could do that, um, we started just playing tackle when the teachers weren't watching <laughs> because it's a lot easier to shut down a play when you can just take them out. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and eventually it went from, you're not allowed to tackle to we'll send the, uh, the regional rugby league coach who's our assistant principal down to supervise you. So if you're going to tackle, do it properly properly Mm. and um, I I was lucky in that I was never told not to do something Um, so even if we did it and it it didn't work that's fine I was allowed to do that Um, so if I got myself into a poor position to tackle a kid that's three times my size I learned my lesson very quickly I either don't do it or get in a better position Um, and so we had the freedom to do that thankfully when we were learning just playing around in the schoolyard Awesome. I mean, and it's like, I lo- see that again, a little bit of that's been lost, I think, from mm-hmm. uh, the youth sport experience in the sense that yeah. a lot of kids, they never get the opportunity to play with other age groups because, you know, you're always doing it similar age. Now, you do get differentials mm-hmm. in size, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's always done in a very controlled, a, a relatively controlled environment. And I genuinely mm-hmm. think that that kind of free play experience where you're sort of learning oh blimey if I try that then I'm going to get myself in in some real trouble but it's in a a free play environment where the the consequences of failure aren't so bad so I think part of the problem with organized sport is the kids feel like they've got to make that tackle because otherwise the team's going to lose and then they get in a bad position and they get really badly injured whereas in free play you're a little bit more loose about it and you can kind of get off it it doesn't matter if you don't make it right that that kind of experiential side is really key I think Mm, and then even training, like trying to incorporate that in a training session as well is becoming really difficult because if you get it wrong, you can scare them out of failure forever. And I have a, I've had a number of sessions that I've misjudged where that line could be for that day, especially for someone who's had a long day at school or high school girls are, are pretty common to come to training already feeling like they want to cry. So the last thing they want to do is a failure session. Um, but it got to the stage where they would do the activity, they'd put their whole heart in it, they'd come off, have a cry about it, tell me what was frustrating them so much because it's usually the fact that they're frustrating themselves, that they can't do what they want to do and it's in here but they just can't make it happen. Um, and then we go through that process of reflecting well, if you could tell yourself what to do next time and you're watching from above, what would you say? And that becomes self-talk. Then they never get to the position anymore where they feel like crying about it. They just stop and reflect. 
quite like that question. I've not, I think I've used something similar, but not quite the same. Mm. If you could tell yourself what to do next time, what would you say? Yeah, if you were watching from the sideline and you wanted someone to like talk you through it, what would you say? Because we're not going to be out there to do that, but there's nothing stopping you from thinking it. And then they've got that as a reference point, like you say, from a psychological principle around self-talk. Yeah. They can use that as a reference point. And they'll, I mean, I'm assuming that that's going to stick with them fairly readily because it's something they came up with based on an emotional struggle. Yeah. And it's you're always going to believe it more when you come up with it yourself. And so I can tell you till the cows come home that what you could be doing, but unless they think it was their idea, they're so much less likely to actually put it into practice. And it doesn't mean as much. Mm -hmm. We see uh, people become dependent on the coach's feedback rather than being able to solve their own problems. What happens if the coach isn't there one week? Mm. What would you say? So I'm writing that down. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a nice little one. So, I wanted to just segue, like I said at the start, at the opening of the show, you're Mm -hmm. over here sharing your research at this global scientific uh, congress. Can I just ask as a starting point, how many other women were in the room? Oh, actually quite a few. So uh, South African University, uh, Rhodes University actually brought, I think it was six or seven female students. Right. And most of them presented in the different sections. So that was really Um, But within the first day, I believe, um, we were talking about the use of data um, Mm. and they were complaining that sometimes it's difficult to access the elite athletes because they've got their own schedules and they can turn around and easily say, you know what, I don't care, I'm not doing your project. Um, Whereas the female athletes are usually a little more curious at the very least and they're willing to give you a go or or share what their insights are and if you want them to, you know, wear a watch for a training session or something, they're they're not, probably not going to say no just on the basis that you ask them. Mm. Um, so there was one girl who started her presentation with saying, you know, I'm the, the first female to present today and I'm the first one to talk about women's cricket and it's a world congress. <laughs> and so there's a test match being played next weekend. Does anybody know where that's happening? No, I didn't think so. Like, but we're all going to watch India play New Zealand. Yeah. And none of those countries mean anything to us. Like... <laughs> So it was one of those interesting moments where the rest of us were sitting in the crowd like, no, it's us too. There are some of this. Like, <laughs> we're coming later in the week. It's okay. But it was just so strong on the first day that straight away she actually added it into her presentation. She didn't notice until she got there and read through all of the other presentations that she was the only one that day presenting on women's cricket. So, yeah, there was also a few... um like experienced coaches, a lot of delegates from the other ICC countries, so a few representatives from Scotland and from Ireland. And um, I don't think the US brought any females, but it's so fresh over there. Um, but, yeah, there was definitely a good representation. I'm going to take a stab and say maybe 40% of the room were actually women. That's cool. I mean, I'm, I, I obviously, you know, asked that question with, you know, a particular slant in mind yeah. around diversity. But actually that's, that's a good that's good news, isn't it? And I mean, interestingly enough, I think um, with the growth of the female game mm-hmm. and, 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 all, and, you know, I'm seeing quite significant growth sort of at the grassroots level, uh, yeah. not as many girls as I'd like in my own coaching cohort. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter's playing and coming through, but, um, but yeah, still seeing growth, growth in the women's game, a lot of interest in the game and, and all that sort of stuff, which is fantastic. And if that's now being mirrored by the research community, um, mm. where you've got kind of more women involved in researching, actively researching the game, I suppose part of that might be to do with the fact that the, the female game is, uh, quite universities are quite, you are quite often at the pinnacle of the, that kind of you often play in the highest club level or something like that. Is there anything to do with that? Uh, yeah, and in England especially, yes, mm. um, because you've got a lot of people who are interested in similar things, so it's a lot easier to get that process started. Uh, we do have a club in Brisbane as well. I think Sydney have a university, like Sydney University is pretty well renowned as well. So um, yeah, once you have like-minded people together, it makes it a lot easier. But other than that, um, our Brisbane clubs are pretty much strategically based. So right. within um, like school catchments and things like that, um, they often have other sports that are nearby or they back off onto some other sporting event. So um, if you've got like a PCYC where the kids play um, gymnastics, you see the kids looking out the windows on the trampoline, you're like, oh, they're playing cricket over there. Mm. Um, and so it just sort of um, 
inspires them to, to keep trying different things. And so sporting clubs t- tend to stick together um, to make it easier as well. When you're going between sports, you don't have to change locations drastically to play the same game. So um, I don't know whether or not they've done that on purpose, but a lot of the times the schools map really closely to clubs. And then um, even as adults that you'll find that suburban areas are really tightly knit. Um, and so you can pretty much put a, a little bowl around a club and that's where most of the people seem to come from in that area. So it's a really strong community tie if you get it right. But if the, the culture is great, then people will travel from the other side of the city just to play for your club. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, so anyway, just for the circling back. So mm-hmm. we now know, so the research, we're thriving in the research stuff. So you have been studying um, a particular cohort of mm. female cricketers, if I'm correct. So talk me through the research and and the, some of the stuff that you were talking about yesterday and then we can start to explore some of the other avenues and some of the exciting places that you're now going to. Yeah, well, um, so it started, funnily enough, with a uh, junior cricket experience and it was me watching a girl hit boundaries for fun. It was a, a softball competition, so the ball was a more rubbery. Um, so the girls weren't so scared of it when it was being bowled at them and she was phenomenal. I've never seen someone strike the ball so freely um, and it turned out that she was from one of the regional towns that was invited. And so um, when you spend some time in those towns and things like that, there's less reservations about what you can do and when you can do it. And so I would expect that she's probably spent a lot of time just playing and just hitting the ball hard. Um, But somebody stopped her and asked her to stop doing that because it was demoralising the bowler. And I'm standing on the other side of the field going, how dare you? (laughs) She will never play great again if you tell her that. So I wrote a research proposal the next day (laughs) posing a a really simple question that a lot of coaches have asked themselves is at what stage should we be taking female cricketers out of that boy system and into an all girl system for the social learning aspects. They're more likely to play if they've never come from that background, if they were in a team with their peers, etc. cetera. Um, and then what's that interaction like? And uh, I think for the moment we're not strong enough to send everybody into that all female pathway just yet. I feel like the training and learning environments probably have a little way to go in terms of how to get that challenge versus participation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to explore what that even looks like and that landed me in the talent development research that is already out there, especially on football. I mean, soccer academies and things like that uh, are well-renowned for picking you know, nine, ten-year-olds and, and putting them into elite performance like academies and then what do you do when you're 11 and you're told you're not good enough to play yeah. the sport that you're just doing for a giggle? Yeah. This podcast has lamented that several times mm, over yeah. over the years. Um, <laughs> we, uh, but so it, what I was thinking there is when you said you delved into the talent development literature and there's a wealth of stuff around that. Mm. How much though is there around answering that specific question around the idea of when's the right moment to take a girl who's previously been playing with boys in a largely male dominated environment in a largely male dominated sport traditionally, yeah. and then take them out of that sort of what you might call localized club environment into uh, a more it, it becomes a bit more of a representative side because I'm assuming that there's like a there'll be like a city-wide club almost created but it's made up of the ha- handful of girls in all the all the clubs who come together to be part of an all-girls club yes is, yeah. that, is that the right yeah. is that what I'm thinking yeah, okay and so yeah, if and then we're slowly getting better yeah uh, yeah yeah exactly as as the numbers increase the, the need to do that decreases because you've got more girls in yeah. your club pathways but for the time being there's a point at which mm. you say well all the girls they're not competing together so at some stage they've got to come together and uh, the question you were posing is when's the right time to do that is that right yeah yeah pretty much and then there's not a lot out there and that's what i found really quickly in the first three months of my phd is just we know a lot about talent and expertise and development in general but when we try to put them together and specify it to a a case like that which we're only really starting to understand now um where do we start because if i don't have a foundation to pin what i want to know on um then everything is like throwing jelly in the wall so that's yeah we've decided if we're going to do this properly um then we need to start to understand what we're currently doing um and the experiences that have got the girls to where they are now um and see if we can provide that environment a bit earlier in the pathway um, and then maybe have some of the reservations that they've had through their experiences solved by the time the next generation comes through. Right. 
I, I know that um, Anya McNamara, who's a, a really good talent development researcher based out of UCLan, mm. um, done lots of really interesting stuff. But she published a study with some colleagues recently around, uh, I think it was entitled What About Me? And it was yeah. based on the idea that most talent development research is based on male participants. There's very, very little out there. And I suppose yeah. it was a call to the research community to talk about more female specific talent development research. Did you see that? No, I haven't, but I'm definitely going to check it out now because that's going to be heavily featured in some of the work that I'm about to put out. Great. Um, now, the other thing I was going to ask you was, um, so specifically then, you're working, you've done that, so you're, you're in, the, in the process of that piece of research right now, or are you, um, have you completed that piece of research? In which case, what sort of findings did you have? Yeah, so I actually presented on that research yesterday. Um, we've only done the preliminary analysis stuff just to make sure, especially with qualitative research, you want to make sure you're still um, looking at it with the right lens and you don't want to end up biasing it the next time you interview someone if you've already done some of the analysis by you know, asking leading questions and things like that. And so um, we decided to look at the first 10 participants that we've, we've actually had time to transcribe and analyse. I made a mental note um, in my presentation that don't do your own transcription. Uh, by yourself entirely. It is the most mind-numbing thing <laughs> um, you can put yourself through, and that was uh, my self-torture done and dusted for this PhD. Um, but even that process of going through and picking out what people find is important to speak about, regardless of the question that you're asking, you can, you can throw a ballpark figure at the types of themes that they might come up with when you ask a specific question, but you never really know what's so important to them that they're going to speak about it. So you have to tease it out a little bit. And I was lucky with my understanding of ecological dynamics, we pretty much had three key areas that we wanted to understand. So we started with the basic stuff. Did you play as a kid? What kind of sports did you play? Did you have a sibling? What, who got you into cricket? Um, what was that early learning experience like? So we're, we're talking like serious socio-developmental factors that people always say we need to take into consideration, but they don't do it necessarily with athletes until we've now decided that their pathways can be different. So we need to know that kind of stuff to start with. And then we moved on to the, the task factors, so the types of training that they've been involved in, um, what kind of academies and stuff did they participate in, did they have access to the resources to even play cricket, did you have an open field that was big enough, did you ever have a cricket bat in your house, um, and then the environmental factors of the social learning stuff, how early were you in the pathway, how long each stage, what were the aims or the guidelines, were there specific skills that they were trying to develop, um, and then looking specifically at elite performance uh, in general, so what their game factors were like and what does it take to be elite in women's cricket. So um, having done all that, what mm. did you find? Well, a lot of them play. Right. And that was a really big thing. Most of them had some sort of early positive interaction with cricket. Um, it wasn't necessarily a formalised interaction, um, but a lot of them spoke about parental support, um, the fact that even PE teachers encouraged them to sort of play the game even when they weren't sure about it or at least to try it. Um, most of them had or spoke about sampling sport, whether or not they could or couldn't do it. Um, so the hardest thing about using this type of research is until you pull out the specific quotes, um, whether or not it's significant doesn't mean they agreed with it. Um, and so we have to go through every single person and have a look at what their specific quotes were around those themes. But, yeah, especially early on, they just enjoyed the game. And most of them actually decided they wanted to compete and that was the, a really defining factor is that they didn't just want to play the game. Some of them knew from a very early age that they wanted to compete, that they wanted to be the top of their game. And so going through, they took advantage of those training pathways that they were exposed to as a kid. But even most of them entered the pathway before the age of 15. So they're playing representative cricket at a state or county level before the age of 15. Mm. And there are some implications around training loads and how much time you have to play other sports mm. if you're already in that specialised environment and how can we provide them with those diverse learning experiences if they're already there. 15, you compare it to, you compare it to football over here, 15, oh, We're God, they're, they're, they're past it. You know, they're, they're washed up has-beens at 15. <laughs> has they haven't been. engaged in the pre-academy at seven. Then, you oh, know. my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> I've definitely seen some articles about being a has-been at 11. It's crazy. <laughs> so, 
Um, so one of the things that you found that sort of a, a correlation was early positive engagement. Uh, what you, you know, back, backyard with a brother, backyard with a with a dad who's throwing balls and that kind of thing. Is that 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 sort of experiences that you were seeing? Yeah, it's um. Well, we're not allowed to use the word correlational, but okay. um, there were definitely some some key factors that actually popped up as significant themes throughout. Um, and then those significant experiences um, seem to fuel their, their later experiences as well. So when we talk about the role of adaptability in expert performance, um, they were comfortable pointing out specific game moments where that adaptability would, made the difference between what they were trying to achieve and p- perhaps the game outcome that they were working on. And so training for that adaptability it really stood out for them and it was a defining factor in terms of the, the change in T20 cricket, um, the emphasis on big bash compared to one day cricket um, and even asking about whether or not that transition was difficult to navigate. They found it so much easier to do and it didn't even phase them because they would have spent so much time adapting to the environments that they were exposed to as a kid. They might not even realise that they've already been trained for that adaptability. Now, I can hear... Um some podcast critics or Mm. critics of say the ecological approach yeah shouting now saying Mm -hmm. yeah you pull that out because of your bias towards the ecological approach and and you and you fed them that and they just played back to you what you fed them and of course that's the way it is it's it's nothing to do with the hours in the nets that they did doing repeated repeated uh block practice uh Mm -hmm. non-variable block practice adaptability whatever they did hours and hours of block practice that's what made them as good as they are i can hear uh or i can feel if you like that yeah. kind of information from my way so just just to allay any of those fears because i imagine it's been brought up before mm. just just talk us through that a little bit yeah so we actually asked them about the training environments that they're exposed to and and it would have been interesting to see whether or not they had access to more representative environments as they progress through the elite pathway. I mean, you look at some of the training academies and stuff that they have now. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the National Cricket Centre, but we've got two fields out there that are usually available to use. Um, and you'd expect that if you get to that elite level, um, you'd be able to harness that access to resources. Um, I did mention that it was a very rainy summer for um, the lead up to the uh, season that was coming ahead, especially for the WNCL, which is the, the national competition for women in Australia. And um, that impended a little bit on whether or not they were allowed to train outside. But generally speaking, they do. They engage in the net-based training. And I couldn't refute that even if I wanted to. And the whole point was that's not the point. We were just having a look at what they do. And if they've become elite athletes as a result of that, then we have the freedom now to dive into that and be like, well, what is it then? What are they specifically doing that's allowing them to take a net-based environment, which when you glance at it doesn't seem like a very representative learning environment or it doesn't seem like it actually builds the skills to transfer? And then what are they doing so right that they can maintain that elite performance level? Um, And so some of the girls specifically spoke about scenario work. They have competitive nets and because they're usually quite competitive people, they'll set an unrealistic target and do everything they physically can to attain that target and that push allows them to train in that emotional awareness as well as the physical characteristics of the skill. And so when they get to a scary situation where if this last ball goes before you lose or in the example of Claire Kosky, this needs to go for a boundary if you want to stay in the big bash, then what do you do in that situation if you haven't trained for it? Well, they have in a way. Mm. So what you're saying there is that, that what you found was that these elite athletes in particular were in the main articulating to you a story which suggested that they made their practice more purposeful using mm. various forms of variability, regardless of the environment and the limitations of that, they found yeah. ways to make it more purposeful. And so that was something that was a theme that emerged. Is that a right yeah. way to say it? Yeah, yeah. So even though they spoke about net-based training, they still spoke about the fact that player adaptability and uh, that specific skill where they can identify where they've been adaptable was still trained and so they actually, most of them linked that together in their responses. And that was, you know, we trained for bowling a specific number of dot balls in this over. So I went out into the field and I was able to do that. 
yes, there are so many more factors in terms of the fielding positions and the environment and everything like that. And you can, the, the list is too long to it and explain all of the constraints of playing cricket in general. But um, they definitely felt at the very least that they weren't prepared for that kind of environment. It might not have been what training looked like, but there was a way that they've gotten to this stage, even though they were in net-based training environments. Um, which is an interesting finding in itself. Hmm. Yeah, because like naturally for me, I would have thought, and it's something that I've genuinely believed coming through, is that if I can understand where the ball is going off the bat, I'm going to make a more informed decision. But what if that's not necessarily needed and we can sample that information without physically having that distance or that access to resources because there's no way that everybody can train on an open field especially at the community level. So then how do we go about creating that same learning environment that the elites can create and spread it back down the pathway? So um, remind me, uh, forgive me if you said this earlier, but mm-hmm. um, and I missed it, but um, remind me, who was the cohort that you did this study with? Um, so we were um, managed to get access to 16 national level like female cricketers, uh, so they either state or national contracts. Um, and then we actually spoke to their head coaches as well. So we targeted eight head coaches. Um, and then eventually when all of the, the data is transcribed and analysed, um, we can have a look at the differences between the training environments they were trying to design and then how the players felt that those training sessions were going. The, eight, the, head, co- the eight head coaches, where, where were they from? Uh, so are they so national level head coaches or lower down? No, they're the five uh, like state coaches. Okay, so they'd been played some role in their developmental journey. They are the, the direct, um, like national level for the state. Like they're the state head coaches. Okay, but they're not. They're not the current coaches. They're the ones who have played a role in these athletes' developments to get them to national level. They are the current coaches. So oh, the current coaches. Okay, yeah, the environment that they're exposed to now. Yeah. As an elite athlete. What was the purpose of uh, speaking to those head coaches? We wanted to understand the game factors that they found really important in comparison to what the players thought were really important. Mm. Um, so if the head coaches say that the pathway is supposed to provide a generalised you know, skill or they've got guidelines that they want to meet to be able to progress through the pathway comfortably, um, did the athletes feel like that's what they were getting in their experience through the pathway as well? So if they do say that, you know, you want to be able to bowl a certain way or create chances or however you can try to uh, quantify cricket because it's very difficult to write a specific guideline for, but everybody's got a style that they're going for. So how do we ensure that what we're trying to get out of the pathway is what we're asking? getting out of the pathway and then can we map that to make sure that we're doing it properly and what did um did the athletes so it sounds to me like the athletes reflections or their their self-report was based on a more athlete-led approach to let's say traditional or standard net practice Mm -hmm. did any of them report that they were also supported with that by coaches whilst in their developmental journey yeah, so uh, there were only a few people who actually spoke about coaching being a potential limiting factor in right. terms of going all the way through the pathway comfortably. Um, but they didn't speak like significantly about coach adaptability. They mentioned about the training sessions that they were doing and things like that, but they didn't specifically say like the coach is the reason why this happens or um, if it was a negative experience as a junior then usually that was one of the first places that you can turn back and look at and be like I didn't enjoy this at all um and so it was almost this implicit understanding that this is what training looks like not specifically this is how the coach wants training to look like um so that was really interesting it's not that they're not aware that the coach is trying to design this environment they're so embraced by this culture that they don't specifically have to look back to the coach for affirmation every time something happens and so everything feels a little more embedded Mm. And that, is that their current experience or their developmental experience? That would be their current experience, yeah. We ask them largely about what they're experiencing now. I see, okay. So, they, so you don't necessarily have anything on what they were getting as they were developing? Not specifically. I mean, we did ask them about their experiences, um, whether or not skill development practices change during the pathway, but unless they found it worth talking about, a lot of people would be like, oh, yeah, we went from training once a week to training twice a week or, you know, the, the little details that you sort of bank at the back of your head but didn't really stick with you and so and now you've moved on to a different cohort now if i understand correctly you've Mm. got a kind of like a regional or state level cohort is that correct no even lower it's a club level 
So you've got a club level cohort working yeah. with, uh, uh, again, female cricketers, working with uh, their coach, male or female coach? Male coach. And you've tracked their last season, is that correct, over a series yeah. of different markers and, and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, we want to have to look at the uh, the types of training environments they're exposed to. And so if you go all the way back to the start when we spoke about um, whether or not the training environments are ready for females to be challenged, um, if they want to be challenged but don't particularly want to play in the boys' competitions, um, we wanted to see what that environment actually looks like. So we spent a whole season on the ground, 21 training sessions, just looking at, okay, what are the key tenets of session design at this level of the pathway um, because it provides a unique experience for those coming through as juniors to play adult level cricket um, which when you're done like properly and positively can be a, a really protective factor in them staying in the game mm. but at the same time if you graduate that junior pathway and don't like receive a contract the only place left to go is club cricket mm. so can we provide them with a strong enough environment for learning that they feel like they can stay in the game and, and maybe one day get back to that elite level if they wanted to um, and so yeah the, the 21 sessions uh, were interesting um, and it definitely made me reflect on what we consider um, a strong training environment um, and so I delved back in all the research that we know about training for cricket, about expertise, about environments um, and then just pretty much designed a tool that coaches can use um, a genuine scale from zero to three um, to let them know this is what's available at training for the players. And so you got the players to report on that then? I measured the, the training environments upon arrival as we started each activity. And the scale of one to three, how, how did you break that down? It was based, uh, funnily enough, some of the factors that we were looking at actually had three things that you would need if you wanted it to be the, the most representative environment according to the literature that I'd found. And so when we look at decision-making especially, um, there are certain things that need to be available for you to make that good decision. Um, so batting is usually the best example because we can use bat ball contact to decide whether it was a good shot. We can use direction, so how far or where the ball went as a decision. But at the end of the day, if there's no consequence to that bat ball contact and decision, can you ever really tell if you can run? So one component was decision-making. Yeah. And that was defined as being an important aspect of a high-quality training experience. Mm-hmm. Right. Or at least Based a game factor considering yeah. that. Um, so that's a game factor that needs to be considered, the decisions yeah. element. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the other one? Uh, we had a look at feed, so how the batters and bowlers were giving or receiving the ball. Um, as we know, the most representative way you can do that is for a live bowler to bowl at a live batter, um, which is probably one of the things we do maintain really well at training, um, how the bowlers bowl the ball and whether or not that's goal-specific or anything like that. Um, was considered elsewhere, but um, just that pure perception action coupling of live bowl or live batter, um, that's something that we do traditionally well within that training environment. And then what was the third one? Uh, we had information. So right. um, and so that was looking at the sources of information that were available. Uh, we usually have some sort of opponent, um, even though that opponent is usually our teammates. Um, that connection between batter and bowler allows them to compete. Um, and so that provides a better learning experience when you have someone to contest against because that contest is a, a crux of the cricket experience, especially while you're out there. Um, if you're two batters against 11 fielders, can we simulate that feeling at training? Um, we also had the teammates, so batting in a partnership. Are we using that player as a source of information because our decision of where to hit the ball, when to run, who should be on strike, those complex things that we're thinking about while we're out there aren't necessarily used at training. Mm -hmm. um, and so can we actually bring those factors to awareness so they don't feel like they're underprepared when they get into a situation like that in the middle? And finally, it was contextual factors as well. Um, so looking at the pressure of an environment, the scoreboard, the, the time of season, the, the format, the, the team you're playing against, the things that can be really difficult to specifically target, um, but we can provide you know, that scenario-based work where we can simulate that. And so you scored the, you scored the training session, if you like, mm -hmm. created a scoring for it by the availability of the variables against decision making feed the feed of the ball and the information sources and variability was the last one yeah so whether or not it was um uh, within or between task variability yeah and so um and so the, i'm assuming 
the more variability, the more information sources, the more re the more, more more representative the ball feed, and the more uh, decision making opportunities were there. Would would it would incur a, a bigger a higher score yeah. or a, a bigger number than a like, yeah. okay, which is quite a nice way of almost evaluating Quantify, different yeah. practice forms, isn't it? Yeah. And you're never going to probably get an environment where you can maintain all of those things. And Not so, the full game. yeah. So unless, yeah, if you can provide a mini match every game, uh, every training session, good on you. I don't know where you find the people or the turf pitch or the open field, but for those of you who can't access that kind of environment, um, what things can we maintain so that we can keep that score high and still provide a really strong learning environment, even if there are some factors that are necessarily out of our hands. So I, I was talking to you about this yesterday, but I, I provide a mini game every get every for every training session, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it is a it is a it is a challenge. Yeah, there's, there's a number of challenges that I find with cricket in particular, just because of the nature of the game, which yeah. is getting the kids to have enough goes in the time allowed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so they all get a chance to have a bowl, have a bat and do yeah. some of the fielding. So you've got to be quite creative with your practice forms. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you're being creative with your practice forms at the expense of um, some aspects of representation in order yeah. to maintain the, um, you know, to, to create. So I'm always trying to balance the representativeness yeah. from the pure skill acquisition perspective with engagement and and players getting enough goes. Now, the other mm -hmm. way I can mitigate against that is when I've got extra hands on deck in terms of additional coaches' support, then I'm able to then just reduce numbers down so that we're playing lots of sort of micro games, very much backyard style, yeah. um, that means you get loads of goes, loads and loads and loads of goes, and that's a far richer learning environment. We just don't always have that available. However, one thing yeah. that is a constant throughout the whole season is we've never, ever been in the nets, never once. Right. And there's, you know, I've got sort of 20 youngsters, there's 45 in total in the age group, but I've mm -hmm. got other coaches taking care of some of the younger ones. I'm taking the kind of older part of that under 11 age group and there's about 20 players. So sometimes if all 20 arrive, never know how many are going to come as well. But yeah. if all 20 arrive and we've got enough players, then we're going to split that down into about three different games. Mm -hmm. If I've got slightly less than that, and it doesn't warrant splitting it up, then we might go into a pairs format. Generally speaking, trying to keep keep some consistency. Yeah. What's really interesting was we played a map. We've been working all season long on two or three elements, really. Mm -hmm. One has been our fielding and reducing the number of overthrows because they can be killer. But yeah. in particular, also placing emphasis on our ability to hit the stumps in fielding, right? So mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to affect runouts. Yeah. We haven't worked a lot on catching. Um, a lot of the players are quite scared of the ball. Ah, uh, um, yes. <laughs> and and as a result of that, I felt like it wasn't actually worth placing that much emphasis on catching at this mm -hmm. point until, you know, they get used and they're a bit older and they're ready for, and they've been playing with hardball for a bit longer and are yeah. therefore not got the fear factor. Then we can start to build into their repertoire, I think. We could do a lot more around catching. I actually yeah. played a little catching game as a kind of a rival activity last week where they were basically just throwing the ball. It's called bomb the base. Throw the ball <laughs> into, your t into your opposition. Oh, yeah. It was 3v3 get it to land in their base and you blow them up it's like battleships right like grenades you've got to catch the grenade before it blows up um, yeah but some of the kids just were like you know, the, the the pain affordance was so strong they just let it they just didn't, it didn't matter how many points i gave them or <laughs> what consequences you put in they were dodging it they're getting out of the way wow so it said to me a lot about their readiness for that kind of yeah. so anyway so that's so we're playing that kind of game form with the obvious sacrifices of the number of repetitions that they get. One mm -hmm. of the things they tend to do, a, a good chunk of them anyway, is in the week they'll go off to the net, just as like a you know, group, of, group of kids will do, That's and great. go and hit balls, which is fine. So they're getting yeah. loads of reps there. What I'm doing in my environment is I'm trying to create something as representative as possible because I want them to learn about the game. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about that was we've sort of been tracking – you know, our kind of our run outs. So we've got a few little metrics we're looking at. One is, so it's two things really. We're working on running between the wickets. They're not all strong enough to hit loads of boundaries. So running between the wickets gets you four and over at minimum. So 
they've been working on running between the wickets and they've been on run outs. So you can do that. It's got a lovely synergy to it, right? We're going to yeah. try and pinch. We're going to have got a game where you're going to try and pinch singles. The opposition and, and the, the, my teammates are going to try and stop them from getting those singles. And genuinely stop you. It's not like they're going to take it easy on you. No, no, they're absolutely hurling the ball at the stump. Yeah. And and of course, if if they give away an overthrow, then the batting team get to stay in longer by getting an extra life. Yeah. So that's the game form. We played a game last night. Uh, it's like a rearranged game. And uh, I got a message from the, the coach this morning saying it was really great to see a well-drilled running team playing really good cricket. Now, oh. obviously, the word drill made me shudder a oh. little bit. But I could, hear what he was try- I could hear what he was trying to say, which yeah. was basically saying, your kids actually... Could they, could they could run and they, could, they knew exactly when to run. They could hit the ball in the right places and they knew if they went quick, called quick, they got in, they backed up. We actually gave away three overthrows last, last night, which was actually poor <laughs> for us. They themselves have said they want zero overthrows. Oh. Um, they also said they wanted a zero drop catches, but they dropped two in the first over. But that's just by the by. But anyway, they, they, they just said that that's, that's what they were after. And it's been quite interesting just to develop that. It was nice to get that little bit of feedback. But um, it's very interesting watching them without mm. any explicit – explicit. Uh, uh, sorry, not true. On occasion, I have had to draw attention to certain yeah. moments where there's been an overthrow on mm-hmm. occasion but more often than not the game has provided the, enough feedback by the fact that we've just given those batters an extra life we're not going to get a bat now come on let's get ourselves in the right places and now it's starting to happen semi-automatically That's yeah quite good to see and it, and they're going to remember that process of learning as well like it's not going to be oh was that a bad overthrow and then look for that confirmation elsewhere and so when they become intrinsic learners Mm. like they'll learn anything if they really want to and so that'll translate into any skill that they want to develop later on and when you have a team-based approach like that where they're genuinely helping each other up And it could have been easy to turn around and be like, oh, no, you did that overthrow. You gave them an extra life. It's like, no, 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 we want to do well because then we all get to bat. And so that's a really good dynamic to have as well. I mean, it can be so difficult with children when that competitive nature just comes over them. (laughs) All that matters is how many points. I've actually genuinely had a quote saying, miss, if we didn't have points, my life would be worth nothing. (laughs) You're 10. <laughs> we didn't have points. My life would be worth nothing. He was a very dramatic kid. But uh, like even then, just that, that notion that there had to be some reason why. <laughs> but I, I like that. I think that, that might be a child's way of saying, if there weren't points on this, it wouldn't, wouldn't matter as much. I wouldn't be doing it. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, pretty yeah. much it. And it, you could see that very quickly. If there wasn't an objective, you, you didn't want a bar of it. Brilliant. Um. So as far as just looking, uh, flicking back to the research and keeping this representativeness, so mm-hmm. in this experience that, you've, that these athletes have had throughout this season-long process of X number of training sessions, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. what did you see in terms of the, you know, you're scoring against these, these, these areas of decision-making, feed, information source, and variability. Mm-hmm. Did you see that it changed a lot and there was a lot of tweaking and amending according to different performance needs that were seen like week to week. All right, we need to focus on this. We need to focus on that. Or Mm -hmm. was it quite consistent, quite and quite stay the same a lot? Honestly, it stayed the same a lot. Um, It was a really interesting thing to witness um, despite changes in a game format, especially. Um, So we play our T20 season right in the middle um, it almost perfectly matches onto where the Big Bash was traditionally um, and so provided club players with the ability to train a little bit extra in terms of game time um, while they were training with the, the, their state contracts as well. And so um, we pretty much had this, a similar approach to training every time. So 50 over cricket for the start of the season, then 20 over cricket, then 50 over cricket again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in both formats, is it like one day international win lose or are you playing 50 over cricket where, you know, you've got to bowl a side out and if you don't bowl them out, it's a draw or is it just straight up win lose? Straight, straight up win up. lose. Okay. So a longer form and a shorter form, but no, no change to practice uh, experience at all, even in that shorter form. Not in those specific 
um, training design elements now. And in, so in terms of the, the numbers you were giving, in terms of the, the amount of decision making, the mm. amount of information sources available and the level of variability, that was constant too? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was so constant I actually couldn't perform a statistical analysis on it because there was no standard deviation. <laughs> That went well. That went down well with the statisticians. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean there's no standard deviation? There must be. <laughs> and, uh, the funny, funny thing about analysis of variation is apparently you need variation. Who <laughs> would have thought? I can't do an ANOVA on something that's constant. <laughs> so do, should I take it from that? And obviously not once, you know, it, it, we're, mm. not, we're not naming any names here. Yeah. But should I take it from that, that the person leading or designing the uh, – training experience the practice experience essentially did exactly the same thing week to week to week to week in those specific factors yeah it was a very similar approach week to week okay so there was variation obviously i suppose who who, who turned up made a difference so which bowler yes. was bowling at which batter and the this the, the process of bowler batter all that sort of stuff but from like the perspective of okay. how much decision making what the ball feed was like the information sources and the level of variability that stayed absolutely constant if you showed up to training and you missed the explanation at the start, you'd still fall into place pretty pretty easily. Because you knew it was going to be the same thing. Yeah, that you really yeah. Okay. And, I mean, just give me an, 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 an outline of what, what the training, look, this constant training form looked like. Well, it's so. Uh, I guess if you picture what a typical uh, training environment for cricket is, um, I imagine it was the same as most clubs um, in terms of you show up, you field for half an hour, and that's usually including a throwing program of some sort, um, some catches off the bat, some run out like simulation drills, um, and then we spend the next hour in the nets batting and bowling. And you got what, say, three nets and three batters, and then the remaining people sort of split up in bowling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we usually train as a squad. So we have the first grade and second grade girls training together, um, and we usually pair up our batters um, to make it easier, so they can go for about twenty to thirty minutes. Um, but they'll bat as a pair. So when you say they bat as a pair, they bat as a pair in the net. Yes. And swap over. Yeah, rotate strike. Uh, do they run? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> not usually I mean there's the opportunity to if you wanted to genuinely set up a scenario where you'd have to run between the wickets or create an opportunity yeah. to run um, and you know not be able to rotate the strike but more commonly it was just if you face three balls uh, swap over so and the reason to face three balls was to give enough reps per per deliver per ball but yeah. but then to do, have a degree of representativeness in the sense that strike swaps in the game and therefore you don't just stand there facing ball after ball after ball is that the reason mm -hmm. to do so i believe so i mean it would definitely make sense if that was the objective i think it was just more a time on task thing making sure yeah someone doesn't soak up one end um i feel like there's an opportunity to force that rotation of strike and um, yeah. so it'd be quite easy to create a scenario around that if you wanted to really enforce that behavior um so not just facing those three balls but making sure that third ball is a shot that you could rotate strike off and they get into healthy habits around that. But again, it's, it's, it can either be a scenario and it's really restricted by how far the ball can go, or you create an environment where you have a, a field on a whiteboard um, and you pretty much just argue with the bowler whether or not it would be a run. Yeah. Cause instantly, instantly I'm thinking um, like, for example, let's say you wanted to encourage scoring shots yeah, but not necessarily boundaries like big mm. scoring shots, but scoring shots. You know, you'd create some spaces that you saw, you saw as as scoring spaces, perhaps based on uh, like a particular area that the the batter is struggling to score within. So, like yeah. my my kids, for example, tend to struggle on full length offside deliveries. Haven't Ooh, quite yeah. got that cover drive shot yet. They they like yeah. to score on the leg side with pull shots, but so for example, you'd say right, that's you know over there you know that this isn't that's where you're going to get your scoring point but if you if for example you don't execute that shot effectively so it wouldn't be a mm -hmm. scoring shot you swap so you yeah. lose your strike yeah so it encourages the individual constant. to actually try and get into that position effectively I'd, I'd, that yeah. would be the natural variability i'd try and create 
Yeah. And there are so many things that are like, you're only limited by your creativity in some cases. You, again, you just have to be careful to make sure the environment or the, the habit that you're encouraging is one that's going to be functional when yeah. they get to the performance environment. And, you know, sometimes we can go the other way. And I remember like we had a chat about this yesterday, accidentally creating tipsy run or hit and run. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Doing the rotation of the strike. And sometimes that can actually be dysfunctional um, because we're taking away that decision making element of when to run. Um, and I witnessed that very quickly when my team finished on negative 25 in total once during a training session because yeah. every time they hit the ball, they just left the crease without yeah. thinking not whether it will be a run. And so we had to have a chat about, you know, when do you make a decision and what does a decision look like? Um, and then at what stage of that batting performance do you start to make decisions? They're 12. Like it's a pretty complex conversation to be having with them. But they realized that maybe – running every single time I hit or miss the ball is probably not the best way to approach cricket. <laughs> and they just didn't know what to do about that. <laughs> that, exact, that exact same thing happened to me because in an effort to give kids enough goes, yeah. <laughs> enough goes at bat, yeah. I, I, I encourage them to, uh, you know, we were playing that hit and run type game. You know, yeah. I also wanted the fielders to be really engaged because I wanted them to get lots of opportunities to have run outs. And then there was lots of opportunities to do backing up and make sure there weren't any overthrows. Yeah. But in, in so doing, we did have a game in the middle of the season. In fact, it was the one of the yeah, middle of the season where we had four run outs because <laughs> they were just going, be it go. <laughs> and, and it's not wrong <laughs> yeah well and also we we were playing in eight aside eight, uh, eight aside games where you know there's quite a bit of space to hit hit into and run but then all of a sudden in this game we happened to be playing 11 aside and there was far less gaps but it was still mm -hmm. hitting and go now the opposition fielded well and they hit the stumps four times i mean you're not gonna yeah. happen every week but yeah, even so it was an in interesting lesson in and i then re i me remodified the game then after that to create mm -hmm. an element of decision making with it yeah yeah. Yeah. And then, but even that learning experience of but this is exactly what we were doing in training. Why doesn't it work in a game? Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there like, Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I misjudged that one. That's okay, we'll work on that. Um but like even those moments they don't particularly blame you for it, but they've already made that connection that I was I was doing this at yeah. training and now I tried it here and it didn't work. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> And you're also sitting there going, now what? <laughs> so I like this because we're actually talking about your research and using it as a springboard off to different ideas around how we would create different levels of variability. So, so one thing I was going to say is, so we've got a very, very constant practice environment. So I'm, yeah. going to, I'm assuming now that that lends itself to really constant performances. Not necessarily. I mean, the, the link between performance is always difficult to make, especially when um, there are so many contributing factors to performance. And, and we know there are so many more that we could probably measure at the moment and measure reliably. Um, and so it was interesting to have a look at, you know, the key performance indicators that we were already measuring as a team. I mean, key performance indicators have been used since I was about 15 years old. And it's nice to have little benchmarks of if we do this well, we will potentially have a positive game outcome. But that potentially is a very key word in that sentence. And so, um, yeah, our key performance indicator, like a, a success, I guess you could say, wasn't particularly constant throughout. Um, but there are so many different things that can contribute to whether or not we bowl well or bat well. Um, so it was very difficult to say that the training environment was the cause of that. And so we never really go that far. Um, but it was interesting to see the connection between them. And it makes for a very funky graph. But, but given that um, the, practice the, the purpose of a practice environment, mm. the purpose of coaching, the purpose of what we're trying to do is to do however great or small – that practice environment is on the outcome in terms of performance. Yeah. Given that we as coaches are utilized, it's one of the, one of the few things th that we can actually control as a means by which to bring about enhanced performance. Yeah. What you'd hope to see using your practice form is mm. that, I mean, if you're intentional about your practice form, that is right. So you're saying, right, I'm intentional about, so if, if this coach in particular is saying, right, I'm going to keep a very, very constant practice formula. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I want the players to have a, a good degree of, let's say, um, familiarity 
comfort mm. with the practice environment. I want them to be able to grow slowly to facilitate learning. I don't want to throw too much variability at them because that might destabilize them. So let's yeah. imagine that's your rationale and they're all, that's all they're perfectly, I mean, how, how, whatever we think about that as a rationale, I could yeah. actually understand a coach making that rationale. And to be fair to them, if they were to say that to me, I would probably say, fair enough. Yeah, that's now, understandable. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to create constancy. So then what you're then looking for, I would say, would be some performance markers that would give you a clue as to whether that practice form is having the desired effect, not, yeah. notwithstanding the other variables at play, weather, um, opposition, uh, certain individual batting performances, people, mm. bad luck, a whole range of variables, get all that, right? Mm. But there would be some things that you'd expect. So like with me, for example, yeah. in my tra training environment, I am deliberately trying to focus on runouts, backing up, stealing singles. Right? Yeah. I'm hoping that I'm going to see some of that behavior in the, tr in the, in the match environment. And if <coughs> I don't, I've got to change the practice form. Yeah. And I, admittedly, it's got to, over a period of time, I'm not expecting them to get it overnight. Okay. And we're tracked. So that's the marker I'm tracking to see whether it translates. Now, did you see, I'm not saying, I'm speculating as to whether that was the, but, but with a <laughs> very constant practice form, mm. my thinking would be, uh, regardless of where they perform, that there would be some consistent markers of performance but I'm mm. detecting from what you're telling me that actually the performance was really quite variable. Yeah. Which is a, which is a surprising outcome, is it not? Yeah. And um, I feel like that could be from a variety of things always. Um, but when we do look at the training environment that they were exposed to, if you were to put um, a specific lens on a, a behavior that you're trying to work towards, maybe that constant practice does become beneficial. Um, but because there's a lack of decision-making or variability or, or whatever it is, there's always going to be something missing if it's too low. And so we're never going to get perfect. But if it's so low that there's not, particu like not particularly there. So if I'm not batting with a partner or I am but I'm not using that information, does that mean I don't use that information in a game? So it's a bit hard to have no runouts at all, as, which is one of our well, batting KPIs is to not get run out. Um, but I'm not training the use of that information. and having a partner at the other end is only one aspect yeah. of that particular KPI. And yeah. so how do we train the decision-making of which fielder I'm going to take on and when am I going to take them on? Am I going to take them on early when it's the first over and everyone's sitting back on their heels? Or yeah. am I going to take them on in the last over when we need these runs? And there's a probability that I'm going to make it before they can throw it. Um, and so there's always going to be some things that we can't necessarily train in specific environments. Like can we be become attuned to them? And if we had a specific lens to work on, it might be that constant practice could be a beneficial thing because you almost become um, familiar, which is a really great word. I like that you become familiar with those affordances. So they don't become foreign when you get to the game. You're in the moment and you think, I can do that. And you're seeing it almost as it happens or even before it happens. Mm, I mean, there's, there is a uh, – in this practice sessions that I'm designing, mm. there is a relative constancy in terms of – there's nearly always a focus on those three components. They're the only mm. markers that we're really tracking against, and they're the key key areas that we just want to develop this this season. And yeah. it's a short season. It's for what, 15, 20 sessions, something like that? So in, yeah. real, in real terms, it's 15 hours worth of, of training experience, or an hour and a half, so it's probably um, slightly more than that, 20-odd 20, 20 hours. But the, mm -hmm. the point is, is that, you know, I'm just saying, well, I'm not going to try and do everything. I'm not going to be getting them to play different shots. I'm not going to work on any of those things. They can work on those different scoring ideas for themselves. The key mm -hmm. bit is, where can you score? And we might change it slightly by uh, sometimes what we do is we put extra score, extra points on certain boundaries, maybe to encourage mm -hmm. shots to the upside. But but in general, it's we're trying to maintain, not, not mess it up too much, try and keep some degree of consistency, but also adding in little bits and pieces as we, as we go. But the bit for me that I try and always keep constant in your scoring, right? So if it was marks yeah. out of three on decision-making, marks out of, out of three on, on ball feed, all, all and I'm, I'm assuming three being maximum fidelity with the, or as close as, close as, as possible, given the limitations of the environment, maximum fidelity with the performance amount. So ma ma maximum representativeness. Yeah, three out nice. of three. I would hope that I would be scoring at, at, as, as close to three out of three on decision making, three out of three on ball feed, three out of three on information sources, and three out of three mm -hmm. on variability. 
every practice form would be as close to three. Yeah. You wouldn't see the, that reduced variability in general. That's the yeah. only thing you'd probably... So that's what I'd say is, is that yeah. I'm trying to keep it as close to the game as possible whilst making it still an experience for them to have. Mm -hmm. And you can still have a constant experience and then change the lens that you're approaching. Yeah. And so it's not like you specifically have to reduce variability to achieve a certain outcome or, or increase variability to achieve a certain outcome. It's yeah. just that the nature of some of these activities yeah. demands something else. And so if we're not changing to adapt to the, the behaviors that we're looking for, if we're not looking at scoring shot percentages in relation to a, a T20 game compared to a 50 over game. I'd like to think scoring shot percentage, you wanted a little bit higher for a T20 just to give yourself that bit of a buffer. Yeah. But if we're reflecting that in our training sessions, are we creating the right environment to promote those behaviors? Yeah. Um, so it might look constant on the whole. And if you zoom out far enough, everything looks constant. But when we look at the nitty gritty performance factors that we're already measuring, is there a way that we can more specifically influence that? And then can we play around with those concepts of just using external based like reward systems and things like that, that encourage behaviors that might not necessarily be picked up in these specific measures. So going back to your point, your, your, the practice design that you've been following mm. you, it, it's largely what I think uh, David Hinchliffe, who's been on the podcast previously, he's another cricket coach, yeah. uh, would call standard nets. It sounds to me like it's fairly standard stuff in the sense that in terms of the amount of decision making, it's probably a one in terms of it's relatively low in yeah. terms of ball feed that's probably that's bowlers bowling against batters so that's high that's three it's pretty good yeah yeah the inf available information sources is low mm -hmm. and the amount of variability is low yeah right okay so so at least we're not doing bowling machines yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming around. <laughs> I, like I can definitely see the time and place for time on task. Yeah. And that's always going to be the argument, isn't it? You can't constantly ask your bowlers to bowl at batters just for the sake of the batters having time on task. And so there are definitely things that you can do around that. But uh, even with the, the dog throwers, so with the sidearms, I mean, the release point is above the hand. Mm. We know that we look at specific visual cues in the arm and the torso and the approach of a bowler. Yeah. And so you can always argue, well, that's not representative enough either. I also yeah. don't have a shoulder anymore because I've been coaching for 10 years. So which one do you want? And so there are always going to be times where you can't score that perfect three. Yeah. But what's yeah. that's as close as possible? And if we approach every session like that, we'll probably find a solution where you can do both. My biggest thing is stationary balls. Oh, you That's mean hit, hitting a stationary ball? Hitting on the a stationary feet. ball. Yeah. Or a, or a drop ball, drop feed? No. No. <laughs> Avoid if possible, please. Underarm feed? Oh, st still not the same visual characteristics and so ball flight like characteristics. Yeah, an overarm throw feed? It's getting better. I, I actually think that's probably one of the best things that we could do, especially with spin bowling. Yeah. What, so bowling a spinner with an overarm throw? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're not a spinner, but you can still recreate some of the characteristics um, so you can pick them up. So I bowl when I'm in the nets with my son because he says, Dad, Dad, we want to go to the nets. Fine. I bowl off a knee because I'm trying to approximate the height of delivery. Yeah. And also the bounce because when I bowl to him, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly tall, but it bounces. Yeah. I can't replay the shot. So I'm trying to get the ball to come at him roughly at the height. And actually, out of the hand – off the same length, out of the hand, it goes up slightly before it comes down. Whereas if I'm stood up bowling off 22 or even 22, you know, it's going down more or less straight away to him. Yeah. So by being on my knee, he can see the ball coming at him and he can pick the length up a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that he's regularly exposed to. Well, hopefully. I mean, he has adults bowling at him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, as he's getting a bit older, I, start, I need to put more pace, so I have to probably mm -hmm. stand up because it's more difficult to bowl with pace off one leg. But yeah. one leg, I can't bowl that fast anyway. But yeah. uh, fast enough <laughs> right now. It's so. it fine, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, saw, I saw this happening yesterday, actually. I was watching a coach um, in the nets with a young player who's actually in the opposition. And, and the, 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 the coach he got, has got to be six foot four. And he's got a dog thrower. And the yeah. kid he's bowling at is about 14, 15. And he's got this dog thrower and he's throwing from 17 yards, maybe what, 18 yards. So he's coming over wow. the line with a dog thrower. And it's going, it's literally flying past this kid's shoulders. And it's like, Ooh. oh, you're not, oh, you're not doing this. And I was a bit like, mm, I just don't know about that. I just, there's a part of me, yeah. 
a little bit overused, I think. And I, I get the I get the point that, like you say, you know, sometimes you want to generate pace and all that stuff, but just feel like they're becoming a little bit like, oh, it's the thing to have as a coach now, and that, that's what that, that's the thing you've got to do. Without thinking about what that particular approach is actually providing the player with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I take your point, by the way, uh, with the bowling machines as being slightly naughty, but but the point I'm trying to make is. It's, it's about being representative enough. Yes. And, you know, it'd be interesting, actually. I don't know whether you've actually looked at this, but given you using your scoring system mm. based on representativeness, it'd be mm. interesting to sort of almost have like a benchmark threshold. It's obviously mm. going to be based on the intent, but it's almost yeah. like saying, you know, you could say to yourself, right, I'm going to design a practice that's never going to go below. Let's just, So there's 12 points available here. Mm. You're going to design practice that never go below 10, 9, something like yeah. that. Because you might yeah. have to sacrifice representativeness somewhere, yeah. but as long as you maintain fidelity in the other areas, you, you're all right, you're golden. You're really good. And I would say if you were to rank them almost in hierarchy, like that feed is, is probably always going to be one of the biggest ones. So we always want them to be able to pick up as many cues from the person that they're contesting with as possible. Sure. And then we could sort of work back from there. If we want them to make good decisions, if decision-making in a game Mm. is something that they're not particularly doing well or doing too slowly even, which we find like it's not that they understand, they don't understand the game. It's they don't understand it enough to put themselves in a good position. Right. And then they start to feel that as well when they they feel their skills are letting them down or it's up here and they're not happening. Um, Yeah, again, it depends on the type of approach that you want to get to the behavior that you want as an outcome. But like relatively speaking, as long as you can maintain perception, action, coupling, that's a great start. And then from there, we can work out what we can and can't sacrifice. But I mean, we sacrifice a lot of it already and it's not like it's impossible to become an elite performer with this type of approach. It's more how can we maximize it at an earlier level so we get more of access to talent development practices in general. We don't have to be in a classroom. It's interesting because... I that point about the feeds actually a really interesting one because in a lot of the game forms that I'm creating obviously I want the players to bowl yeah but one of the things that does is they still spray it about you know so you'll get, which is quite a good thing I suppose because they're supposed to be you know that's what they're going to get on a game so they may as well experience that but what they then do is given that they only get you know, usually they're batting for four overs. So in reality, best will in the world are going to get 12 shots. Yeah. So the problem I've got there is, is actually I probably on some occasions need to at least feed two of those overs so that they get the same delivery in the same area and enough goes at trying to score from that delivery. Yeah. Um, so I haven't thought about that. So that's an interesting thing I'm going to take away from our conversation, Alex. Mm. And, and see if there's a way, or well, even if you have one of the players doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so so you, got- you don't have to fight that height thing. But we often had um, girls who had maxed out on their loads already from other training sessions. And so they would come in and, and there's still that competitive nature of it being your teammate. Um, and then they would come in. But even then you get bored by the end of it. So you start bowling bounces for fun and things like that. And you have to stop and go, okay, well, are we actually still training or are you just having fun and someone else is trying to wait for a ball that they can hit? Um, and so like, that's probably one of the downsides of getting the players to do it. Um, but other than that, like the more uh, you can get away with not having to, to be involved, the yeah, more they yeah. feel like they're in control of what they're doing. And so, I, I mean, extras in themselves are something that everybody's still working on trying to reduce. <laughs> so just another one, another, you just touched on something there. I haven't really talked about bowling very much yet, apart from mm-hmm. feeds, but, um, in terms of where we started and you talking about creating traps, one mm-hmm. of the things that occurred to me the other day that I thought about was so one of the things that happens in standard nets as well is you might have say four sometimes five bowlers who take it in turns yes you never get to bowl six balls in a in a row yes. and I imagine if you're anything like me I need to bowl six balls in a row and the reason being is the first four are designed to lull I'm, I'm bowling spin right but so I'm the first four are designed to lull the batsman into an idea that the ball is coming in a certain way so that then when I throw a ball that's got a degree of variability either through speed or flight that mm-hmm. has a chance of deception but yeah. when you bowl one ball out of five and then another ball the batsman never gets to get trapped by your deception. So you, you I don't even remember what you tactical. bowled last. Yeah, exactly. So you lose that tactical element. Yeah. And I, I feel like you should bowl overs as a bowler. Now, I know that means other people have got to wait for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't mind bowling an over, you know, or a couple of overs, and then going off and doing some fielding and then rotating back in, bowling a couple mm-hmm. of overs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
And which you can imagine that going from bowling to a fielding exercise and bowling is actually more realistic anyway. I mean, it's probably one of the few things we don't think about is the physical load when we're changing activities, especially in the field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's a whole world of representativeness if you can get away with it. But, yeah, it's um, I, I've pretty much organised it so that feed is obviously over. So I, I split it into two things. It was a, a target for bowling and patterns. Yeah. Because I didn't think you could um, put them in the same category. You can have a really good target where you're bowling at a live bowler, but you're bowling once every six balls. Is that still representative? Well, not really. And so how do we get around that? So we I ranked it as in terms of um, having the full over, so six balls, and then the step down from that is potentially having a partnership. So you work with somebody in the over, mm-hmm. and that allows you to still have that technical Mm. and tactical element um, because you're you're working together um, and it's almost like shoving two overs into one. Mm-hmm. So that ability to bowl in tandem with somebody else, yeah. if they don't necessarily have to be the same type of bowler as you, what if you put a, a spinner and a pace bowler together? Yeah. So that was always my role. I was the medium pacer who uh, complemented a spinner. Yeah. If spin wasn't working, I'd end up with the wickets that they set up. Right. If my pace wasn't working, we'd set up the wicket for the spinner. And it was just this really nice understanding of this is what you're trying to achieve, this is what I'm trying to achieve, which one's going to work better today? And then you have that explicit knowledge of your teammates as well. And so that decision-making when someone needs to come on to bowl, you have this like next-level understanding. And so everybody has a general idea of what's trying to be achieved out there. Um, and so I argued that that was probably a lot better than just bowling interrupted approaches and then back from that to, to score a zero um shortened run-ups kill me <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff coming out now and the rhythm um that you feel when you bowl pace and things like that influencing your ability to to produce the same movement patterns that are functional for you and so not being able to feel that rhythm can get really frustrating at training so that sounds to me that's that's really nice so i'm thinking i'm just trying to think of like the mechanics because often mechanics of practice mm. mean are quite limiting but let's imagine right let's say you've got two nets you've got two uh, let's say you've got a total of let's say 16 players that's a sort of normal size squad ish roughly, yeah, yeah. roughly right so you've got uh let's say you've got two nets in the go because you want to keep one one in the middle sort of semi-free maybe for the keepers to work in or something along those lines uh-huh. um, don't even get me started on keeper training but that's a different different thing um so then um you've got two batters in either net right two two pairs there's four players there yeah right You've then got two pairs of bowlers bowling at each batting pair in overs. So an over from one, an over from another, an over from one, an over from another. So let's say it's four over, four overs at yeah. the batting pair, maybe even more. So that's uh, we've got eight players doing that, and then you've got eight players in the field, and then who uh, doing the fielding, and then you rotate out. So once you've finished your your, your spell, let's say, yeah, bowling pair that the 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 four players rotate out, four new bowlers come in to bowl, and then yeah. you've still got four. Yeah, that would work. That would work really nicely, actually. Mm-hmm. I really, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who has that bowling in pairs. I imagine it happens everywhere, but I, I've never seen that at club level. I've never seen bowling six balls at pairs. All I've ever seen is, I'll run in, have my go. I'll run in, have my go. And it's just pointless. Yeah. Not point, and not pointless. Something- it's not pointless. It's just not no. where it could be. It could be a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that approach, we actually had a lot of competitions like that, how many runs you could score off a certain somebody at that at state training sessions. And I always found that the most engaging because you genuinely want to stop them from scoring a run. And there were some very heated arguments about whether it was a four or not, um, whether or not the fielder was quite there or not. And then uh, people start to get animated and care about training. And so the, one of the biggest things about having the same stimulus every single time you show up is it's very easy to come quite apathetic. Um, and so that's one of the things that we wanted to look at in the future is like what kind of emotions are we eliciting at training? And be- because we know the em- emotional demand of a game is quite high, if we're training in a low emotional environment, are we actually still training for the game? We can do all the skills and everything like that, but we've all seen those people who like crumble under pressure. Yeah. So can we train that element as well just by keeping it um, – just as representative as we can get away with really. Yeah. You want to create that emotional tension, don't you? Because yeah. that happens. That's where it is. And you know, kids do that inherently. With fours, you want to, it's, I've, I've done it before where I've been bowling at a guy, got hit for a couple of fours and I'm like, you know, I can genuinely feel the tension come on and it's almost like I don't even know where I'm letting it go from. 
So then I start yeah. bowling quicker and quicker and quicker, and that doesn't help me necessarily because then he just then I'm just a slow medium pacer that gets smashed even further. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I feel like we've had a massive cricketing geek out session, Alex, but I really appreciate it because you've <laughs> helped me enormously with my way. coaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, those, uh, I've absolutely got loads of ideas from that. That's been fantastic. So <laughs> uh, um, as we wrap up, I mentioned earlier on that um, you're very active on Twitter and sharing some, some good stuff, um, mm -hmm. including some of your own stuff. Where can people track you down? Yeah, I'd say Twitter is probably one of the best things to use. I, I do share some of my stuff on LinkedIn, but it's a very different environment. And so anyone who's really interested in cricket is probably on Twitter anyway. But, yeah, that's definitely the best the best place to find me. Awesome stuff. And what is your Twitter handle? Uh, A-L-A-S-C-U underscore. Yeah. So A-L-A-S-C-U. Alaska. Not a lot of Alaskas around, so it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. Hey, listen, I'm 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 pleased that we could not only get together face to face yesterday, but put this recording on. And um, I think your research is really fantastic and really interesting. Um, I'll do my level best to uh, put some. Is it is some, any of it available online yet, or are you due to publish? Not quite. Yeah, everything's still in the drafting process. It turns out not having published anything before starting a PhD makes it very difficult to write academically first. Go. Um, so I'm still learning a lot. <laughs> Fair enough. That's all. That's all good. You're doing better than I am. I'm, I've made several failed attempts at publishing PhD <laughs> in academic literature. Um, so um, okay, awesome. Um, so basically, it's a watch this space. Follow everybody. Yep. Follow Alex, and then when the research comes out, you can start to pour over it to your heart's content. Definitely some interesting stuff in there. Hopefully, I find something that tickles your fancy. There's plenty out there. I mean, like the the whole creativity is your only limitation is one of my favorite things so i've definitely run wild with some of those ideas awesome stuff alex really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me thank you for having me thanks for listening to the talent equation podcast if you like the show then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player telling your friends about it or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron just head over to the talentequation.co.uk and click on the becoming a patron button at the top of the page so there you have it wow loads going on in uh, in alex's world um for somebody who is relatively tender in years, um, very, very knowledgeable individual and really committed to helping uh, people with this coaching journey, not only as a coach herself, and, uh, but also helping, uh, you know, doing her research to support uh, talent development for female cricketers, all cricketers, and also to help coaches do a better job. Some great lines through that as well. I, you know, you heard me scribbling away. Um, trying to work things through got a lot from that took a lot away to work through with my own coaching um, but you know th this idea that you know if you could tell yourself what to do what would you do it's a lovely simple easy question to ask somebody just to get them to sort of conceive of how they might even almost coach themselves take themselves out of the space um, so that's really interesting I also thought really interesting to see how you know she's studying a piece of you know a coach who's essentially doing exactly the same training every single week no variability whatsoever um, uh, I don't know what the rationale for that is but I just find that really strange and that's something that I just wouldn't be able to do myself uh, just because of the fact that I'd want to be able to sort of meet the needs of those learners so yeah um, really really interesting conversation hope you enjoyed um, as I said at the start of the show, uh, if you want to get involved in the conclave, please do. If you want to become a supporter, please do. Got those tickets up for grabs. So if you want to get involved and uh, and get involved with myself and Russell Earnshaw and Fletch and Sarah Kelleher, and you get an opportunity to come and see us all in action, then uh, get involved and uh, and uh, I'll hopefully slide you one of those discounts. In the meantime, have a great week of coaching and remember, ditch those drills.